Thanks very much to the organizers for the invitation and for putting together this very timely workshop. I understand the topic for the entire today day today is supermassive black holes and supermassive black hole binaries. And one of the most interesting things about supermassive black hole binaries is that they emit gravitational waves. So I've structured my talk today to be observationally focused on that topic. And we'll hear more from the theory side and the simulation side in the next talk and throughout the rest of the day. But this talk will be mostly focused on the observations. And as we go, I'll be highlighting some of the results from my group, including current members, Amy Schechter and Joe Simon, and recently graduated students, uh, Aaron Stemmo and Rebecca Nevin. So I'd like to begin with some background about the background. So supermassive black hole binaries produce gravitational waves. And if you imagine a universe full of supermassive black hole binaries, there's one over here producing gravitational waves, one over here, one over here. The superposition of the gravitational waves from all of those binaries is called the gravitational wave background. And the gravitational wave background is expected to be detected by pulsar timing arrays in the next year or two. Now, you can also detect gravitational waves from individual supermassive black hole binaries, and that'll be something that's accessible to pulsar timing arrays in the more distant future, and then really be accessible to LISA in the much more distant future. But since the gravitational wave background is expected to be the first detection of gravitational waves from supermassive black holes, that's going to be the focus of my talk today is the gravitational wave background. So the signature of a gravitational wave background should look something like this. So you have a pulsar timing array, you're monitoring a population of pulsars on the sky. You can plot the correlation of arrival times between the pulses that you're getting from these different pulsars against the angle between the pulsars on the sky. And if there is a gravitational wave background that's changing space time as the pulses are traveling from the pulsar to Earth, then you should get this sort of correlated pattern in, shown in this is an example in this red curve here that's called a Hellings and Downs curve. So pulsar timing rays, including Nanograv and including the International Pulsar Timing Ray, have been working hard on monitoring pulsars and making these plots. And so the current state of things is that both IPTAs and Nanograv are detecting hints of some kind of correlated pattern in, uh, in, in their data here. And so this is a plot from the most recent data release from Nanograv that shows, you can see in the orange points, it looks like there's a hint of something going on. The dashed line shows you an example of a Hellings and Downs curve. It's not a fit but just to show you an example of what a correlation would look like. So there's no definitive detection here, but the expectation is that in the next few years, we may be seeing our first definitive detection of a gravitational wave background from pulsar timing arrays. So sitting here on the cusp of this detection, we can start thinking about how we can glean the most astrophysics from such a detection. And we can glean the most astrophysics if we build models of the population of merging supermassive black hole binaries that are producing this signal. So the rest of my talk is going to be dedicated to three different observational approaches to estimating the gravitational wave background that you would get from these merging supermassive black hole binaries. So I'm going to start um, from the most direct way by, obser by making observations of the binaries themselves and then moving to less direct ways as we go along. So starting with the most direct way to build a population of merging supermassive black hole binaries is if you observe the supermassive black hole binaries. So to give some context, of where the binary is in the progression of a supermassive black hole merger. If you imagine the early stages of a galaxy merger brings the two black holes close together to kiloparsec or tens of kiloparsec separations. And here I've drawn red dots to indicate where the supermassive black holes are. And so these black hole holes are orbiting in the potential of the host galaxy 
but they're losing energy due to dynamical friction and eventually they'll be brought together to form a gravitationally bound binary black hole system, which is shown in the center. And there the separations are less than a parsec. And these are the gravitationally bound systems that we expect should eventually coalesce uh, into a, a single black hole at the center of the merged galaxy. Now there's a lot of unknown physics in how exactly you get the black holes from these larger separations down to uh, the gravitational wave scale. And I'll come back to those unknowns at the very end of the talk. And I think that'll be a subject a lot of discussion today as well. So I'm gonna start with observations of supermassive black hole binaries and give you a summary of four different observational approaches to finding binaries. So beginning with the most direct thing you can do is get some direct imaging of the binaries and actually spatially resolve them. And here we're gonna focus on radio observations because radio has the excellent spatial resolution that you need to resolve these uh, black hole pairs at such small separations. So Sarah burks Floor did a search through archival VLBI observations of AGN looking for any binary AGN that might exist in those data with that exquisite spatial resolution. And she uncovered one supermassive black hole binary, which was actually a rediscovery because this, uh, this binary was first reported about five years early, earlier. And this is uh, the binary in the galaxy 0402 plus 379. It's an elliptical galaxy very nearby, redshift 0.06. And it has two compact flat spectrum radio core AGN that I've labeled in the figure here. And then there, you can also see radio lobes associated with a jet um, coming from one of the cores. And so this uh, system is special because this is still the record holder for the smallest separation AGM pair that has been observationally resolved and confirmed. So seven parsec separation is kind of the record holder for what we've been able to resolve with imaging. And there have been other targeted searches through radio data looking for supermassive black hole binaries, um, looking through a sample of AGN with bright flat spectrum radio cores or a sample of radio bright two mass galaxies. And if you look through thousand or more of these objects, no more binary supermassive black holes have been found in the radio observations. So, a more promising future prospect would be the next generation very large array in order to find more of these supermassive black hole binaries. So if the NGVLA has a main array baseline of 1,000 kilometers, then it would be able to find supermassive black hole binaries at redshifts less than 0.1, and we should be able to grow this catalog of supermassive black hole binaries beyond this one, one system that we know. So the most promising avenue forward here is the NGVLA. Now, moving now from imaging searches for binaries to spectroscopic searches for binaries, another thing you can do is look for signatures in the emission lines of supermassive black hole binaries. So this figure illustrates the idea that's, that's going on here. So imagine you have a supermassive black hole binary one black hole is not active, the other black hole is active and has a broadline region that it's carrying with it. So spectroscopically, we can see that broadline region. And as the black holes are orbiting around each other, when the active black hole is coming towards us, we can see a blue shift in the broad lines. And when it's moving away from us, we can see a red shift. So this kind of periodic velocity shift in the broad lines of the AGM spectra would be a signature of supermassive black hole binaries. And there have been many observational searches for these types of objects and many candidates found. Uh, the example references that I put here were all searches in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey because you need a large spectroscopic catalog to find objects like this. So there are many candidates. Um, the problem is that these kinds of velocity shifts in the broad lines can be, be produced by things other than binaries. You can get them from any kind of AGN variability or AGN outflows. So in order to firm up the evidence that one of your candidates is a binary, what you can do is more long baseline spectroscopic monitoring campaigns, which many groups have been involved in with these candidates to help shore up the evidence for or against them being binaries. 
And the future outlook here is the most promising thing is the black hole mapper uh, campaign for Sloan 5 that's just getting off the ground. And the black hole mapper will provide uh, multi-epic optical spectra for several hundred thousand X-ray sources. So this will be a large spectroscopic catalog with a long type time baseline that you can use to look for these kinds of velocity shifts that might indicate supermassive black hole binaries. Now I focus on these velocity shifts in broad lines as a signature of binaries, but they also could be a signature of another type of supermassive black hole binary, well, binary being the starting point. Um, if you have two supermassive black hole binaries that coalesce, then you can get a gravitational wave recoil from the resultant black hole, and that'll produce the same kind of broad emission, broad emission line velocity shifts in your AGN spectra. So if you have two merging black holes with unequal masses or unequal spins, then the gravitational waves are emitted asymmetrically so that the resultant merged black hole gets a velocity recoil kick in the opposite direction. And um, a lot of these kicks are expected to be small, so the black hole then just settles back to the center of its host galaxy. But some of the recoils can be up to thousands of kilometers per second, and so that can be enough to eject the black hole from its galaxy entirely. So these recoil uh, supermassive black holes are predicted as a consequence of gravitational wave emission, but so far there have been no confirmed cases. There are some interesting candidates, though, and here I'm presenting um, one of the strongest candidates for a recoil supermassive black hole, which is Cosmos J1000. This is a galaxy at point three, redshift point three six that first stood out to us because it's got this beautiful tidal tail, so it looks like a galaxy merger, and then it has these two bright cores in the center that are only separated by two and a half kiloparsec. And Chandra observations show that the southeast core has an X-ray AGN. In the radio observations, you see there's a radio AGN. It's unclear whether there's an AGN in the other core or not. In the recoil scenario, you would expect there shouldn't be any black hole in that other core. You should only see the one merged black hole that's sailing outwards. And then interestingly, we've also seen this velocity shift in the broad lines that can be a signature of binaries, but in this case could also be a signature of a recoil. If that recoiling black hole is carrying along broad lines with it, then the whole system would be moving at 1300 kilometers per second. So this is a strong candidate. The reason it's still a candidate is we haven't been able to pinpoint exactly where those broad lines are coming from and the velocity shift in those broad lines and whether they're from the, the southeast source there. And so um, we've written the JWST proposal that's been accepted for cycle one. So we should get observations in the next year or so that hopefully will confirm whether this is in fact a supermassive black hole recoil or not. So keeping with uh, variability, but moving back to the supermassive black hole binaries, another observational signature of supermassive black hole binaries is variability in the quasar light curves. And so here the idea is if your mass accretion rate onto your supermassive black hole binaries is modulated periodically, then you'll see a periodic variability in your quasar light curve. And so an example of one of those with a variability of five years is shown, is shown here on the right. So there have been several searches for these type of uh, variability in quasar light curves. Uh, including in the Catalina real-time transient survey, in the Palomar transient factory, and in PANSTARS. And there have been several candidates that have come out of that for variability that could explain, be explained by uh, short period supermassive black hole binaries. Now you can also look for this type of variability not only in quasars, but also in blazars. So there have been searches for these types of objects in um, Fermi data as well. And a well-known example of a blazar that is a binary supermassive black hole candidate is OJ-287. In OJ-287, we see quasi-periodic outbursts with a period of 12 years in the light curve. And so that could be a signature of the orbital motion of the binary black hole. And the interesting thing about OJ-287 is just the long time baseline of data that we have for this object. The first data points in the light curve go back to the 19th century. 
So it's been a very well tracked over many of these orbital periods, which makes it a strong candidate for a supermassive black hole binary. Now, the issues with these periodic sign signatures is some of this could also be produced by other non-binary effects like jet precession, hot spots in the accretion disk, warp disks, all sorts of other things. And so more monitoring and more observations are, are required. And the most promising future prospect here, I think, is the LSST quasar catalog, where 20 to 100 million uh, supermassive black hole binary could be found through periodic light curves like this in the quasar catalog for LSST. So that'll be just a huge catalog to work with to find more of these objects to track. Okay, and the last observational signature of supermassive black hole binaries that I'd like to cover today is flaring. So instead of a nice quasi periodic signal signature, maybe you just get one, one flare from a binary that you'll see again when the binary repeats that orientation. But the example of this is a system called Spikey. Um, this is, let's see, a light curve from an AGN observed with Kepler, which when I think Kepler, I don't think of AGN, but Kepler observed a few dozen AGN. This was one of them. It had this interesting flare that you can see kind of highlighted in blue there in the optical light curve. And so this is a type of flare that was predicted that you could get in a supermassive black hole binary if you have the less massive black hole behind the more massive black hole, then that less massive black hole can be self-lensed by the system and you'll get this, get this spike. And so this is an example of a binary system that might merge in the next 100,000 years. So theory has many other predictions of other ways we could observe binaries. And so we're waiting for those predictions to be found in, in other observations as well. But this is the summary of where we are now in terms of observations that might be signatures of supermassive black hole binaries. So returning to my outline of the talk here, we're going to move away from direct tracers of supermassive black hole binaries now to less direct tracers. And as you get more further removed from the binaries themselves, there are more assumptions that you need to make to turn these observations into estimates of the black hole merger rate. So I'm going to talk next about observations of AGN. So there at least you know you have a supermassive black hole. You don't know if it's a binary. And so there are many assumptions that you have to make to move from those observations of quasars themselves to a black hole merger rate. And so this is a nice new paper from Andrew Casey Clyde that gives this kind of flow chart of how this whole quasar based model works for predicting a gravitational wave background. And so here we're using quasars in general, the entire population of quasars to indirectly constrain the supermassive black hole binary population. And in this flow chart, the black represents the theoretical models and assumptions, while the red represents the observables and the empirically constrained models. And so you can see there are two observations here. We know the quasar luminosity function from observations and from, nano, from pulsar timing arrays, we'll have a measurement of the characteristic strain. And so everything else involves a lot of assumptions that we know things about how quasars work. So in this model, you need a black hole mass function to get the black hole merger rate. And the black hole mass function is derived from the observed quasar luminosity function. Then you combine that with an estimate for the Eddington ratio distribution of the lifetime of the quasar. And that's taken from galaxy merger simulations. And then this model assumes that the ratio of quasars and supermassive black hole binaries over cosmic time is fixed. And then they draw the supermassive black hole binary mass ratios from the distribution of merger mass ratios. So assuming that the binary, the, ma the mass ratio of the binaries is tracking the mass ratio of the galaxies in the merger. So there are lots of assumptions to take you from the quasar luminosity function here to what the black hole merger rate will be. Now this model uses the entire population of quasars in general as a whole. Another thing you can do to use AGN to infer the gravitational wave background is to use a specific subpopulation of AGN. 
and that is the dual AGN. So we learned from the binaries that it's very difficult to observationally resolve and confer binaries because of the small separations. But if you go one step earlier in the process to the dual phase, kiloparsec scale separations, those are accessible to observation. So these types of separations, we can observationally resolve, separate, and confirm AGN with kiloparsec scale separations. And so these dual AGN can then be used to infer the gravitational wave background. So there are two AGN in your merger. So you know you've got two supermassive black holes. You know the separation. You can measure that. Here are some examples of some uh, dual AGN from Aaron Stemmo's work, finding these uh, objects in HST catalogs. You can measure the separations. That's the starting point of your black hole merger. And then you can use the luminosities of the AGN to estimate a mass of each black hole in, in the merger. Again, there are assumptions including here, included here, like what the accretion rate is to turn a luminosity into a black hole mass. But your starting observables are the separation and the luminosities of the AGN. And so uh, Andy Goulding had a paper showing how you can turn this into then uh, an inference for what the gravitational wave background would be. And the last observational tracer we can use to get the gravitational wave background is galaxy mergers. So as we move down here with the binaries, we knew there were two black holes. We knew they were in a binary system. With the AGN, we knew there was one black hole. For the dual AGN, we knew there were two, but then we had to do lots of assumptions to go from there to the binary stage. For galaxy mergers, now we don't even know that there are supermassive black holes. We have observations of the galaxies, and we're going to assume there are supermassive black holes at the centers of the galaxies, but we have no requirement that they are AGN, no AGN luminosity or anything built into these models. So moving now to the least direct way of constraining the gravitational wave background with galaxy merger observations. And here's a kind of a parallel schematic from that same paper showing you how to use galaxy mergers to then get the gravitational wave background. And so here the observables are again shown in red. And my goal here is to make these observational inputs, these three inputs as accurate as possible to make this as well as an observationally constrained prediction as we can. So I'll start with the galaxy mass function. I feel pretty good about the galaxy mass function. It's well measured. It's very well un understood. Um, there is uncertainty in it once you start breaking it up by morphology. Like if you want to have a stellar mass function for late type galaxies versus early type galaxies. And then there's uncertainty on the edge of the color cut that you use to do that. So there are, there are things you could do to improve a galaxy stellar mass function. But overall, I think it's pretty well measured and well understood. So I'm not going to talk about that one here, but I'm going to talk about the other two observables, the galaxy pair fraction and then um, scaling relations that we use to get the black hole mass. So I'll start with the galaxy pairs. So we need to use some sort of assumption to find galaxy mergers in the first place. And so looking for pairs of galaxies on the sky, close separation pairs, is a good place to start to find galaxy mergers. And so many frameworks use galaxy pairs to, as a tracer of galaxy mergers. Now, galaxy pairs are really good overall. Where they fall down is there's uh, a possibility of false positives. You could have a pair of close galaxies on the sky that's not actually related and not actually merging. Um, and then pairs are incomplete at small separations. Once you get to the late stages in the merger, you can't well separate the two bulges any well, very well. And so galaxy pairs are not as good at tracing those really late stage separation mergers, um, which are the stages we're most interested in for binaries because the binaries are forming at those very late stages where you no longer have two discrete separate stellar bulges. So I'd like to think about some other techniques that we could use to give us observational access to those later stages of the mergers to build a sample of galaxy mergers that more fully traces those late stages. And so I'll give you two examples of other observational approaches we could use. So one is to use stellar kinematics of the galaxy. 
And this is a this is a relatively new thing. Almost all galaxy merger studies have relied on galaxy imaging because that's usually what we have, the image of the galaxy. But with the advent of large spectroscopic integral field unit surveys of galaxies like MONGA, we're getting access to the kinematics and the stellar kinematics across the galaxy for the first time. And so we can use those stellar kinematics as an additional way to find galaxy mergers instead of relying on just the imaging. And so this is work that um, Becky Nevin has done. And she starts with simulations of galaxy mergers. And then that hexagon shows you what the field of view of a manga observation would be. And from the simulations, you can pull out a stellar velocity map like the ones that manga uh, would see. And you can look at rotation in the stellar velocity map. And if it's an isolated galaxy, you'll probably just see pure rotation, maybe a bar, maybe a couple other things going on, but not much else in the stellar kinematics. Whereas if there's a merger, you'll see more kinematic disturbances in those stellar velocity maps. So you can use these expectations from the simulations to give you an idea of what kind of stellar kinematic signatures trace mergers and then go and look for those in manga galaxies. And so that is what Becky has done. And she's found that overall, if you had to choose one, imaging does a better job at finding galaxy mergers than kinematics alone. But where the kinematics really shine is in finding those late stage galaxy mergers, where in the imaging, especially if you don't have deep imaging, the galaxy looks really calmed down and you don't see much evidence of a merger, whereas in the kinematics, you can still see the stars being stirred up in kinematic signatures of a merger. Now, the limitation of this is that the largest integral field spectroscopic survey of galaxies is MANGA. MANGA is still pretty small. It's only 10,000 galaxies, and it's at a really limited redshift range. Uh, the average redshift is 0.03. So if you want to do an extensive merger rate across many redshift spins, um, manga, manga, manga is, not, is not your survey. So in order to really get a galaxy merger rate uh, across a wide range of redshifts, I think the most promising path forward is with machine learning to train galaxy merger identifications. And this is something that's been explored in recent years using many different surveys of galaxies. Um, just to give you one example that my student Amy Schechter is working on, she's using illustrious TNG data and galaxy mergers pulled from there as the training set. This is the true sample of we know that these things are mergers. And she processes the data from TNG to make it look like candles data. And then use that as your training set and then use that to identify uh, galaxy mergers in candles data. And specifically, we're looking out to Redshift 3. So here's an example of an illustrious merger that she pulled out, and then what that merger would look like in different filters of HST imaging that you have for candles. So this is this approach is agnostic to whether there's a certain stellar bulge separation. This looks for all sorts of imaging-based signatures of, of galaxy mergers. So I think that machine learning could bring a more complete sample of galaxy merger identifications as a path forward. Now, the other observable here is you need to get the black hole mass somehow from your observations of your, of your galaxies. And the way that you get your black hole mass is important because biases in the black hole mass estimates can have a large impact on the gravitational wave background that you infer. So many frameworks use the MM bulge relation to get black hole mass. Um, the issue with MM bulge is that it starts to become difficult at high redshift. So beyond about redshift point two, it's difficult to do the bulge disk decomposition to get the bulge mass. And so if you don't know the bulge mass well, then there are other things you can do, like use measure the total galaxy mass and use that to get the bulge, bulge mass. But then that becomes more uncertain, especially as a function of different galaxy type. Um, so there are lots of uncertainties in this approach as you get to higher redshift. You could also use the M-sigma relation to get black hole mass. The problem with that, with that is we don't have the large and deep spectroscopic surveys that you need to get sigma um, for the type of sample you would want to do this galaxy merger rate calculation. So instead, another way that you could get at the black hole mass is by inferring a velocity dispersion from photometric galaxy properties. And this is something that um, Joe Simon is working on. 
So the idea is we have a photometric survey of galaxies. If we measure the stellar mass, effective radius, and CIRSIC index, that's been shown to trace the velocity dispersion well, as this plot on the right shows the inferred velocity dispersion from these three uh, photometric properties versus the measured velocity dispersion from Sloan data. And so if you can infer a uh, velocity dispersion that way, then you can use M sigma to infer the supermassive black hole mass. And so that might be another accurate path forward for building um, a catalog of supermassive black hole masses for these estimates. So to bring it all together, I've talked about three different observationally based approaches to modeling the supermassive black hole binary population. You can use observations of the binaries themselves, of AGN, or of galaxy mergers, and then use different assumptions and models to get to the binary population from there. Uh, soon, we should have a detection of the gravitational wave background, so that'll be our other observation. And so if you combine these two things, then you can infer the binary evolution timescale, which is right now unconstrained by observations. And this time scale is a measurement of how long it takes from the galaxy merger for the binary black hole to form and produce gravitational waves that are detectable by pulsar timing arrays. And so once we have an idea of what that time scale is from these two observables on top, then we can get at all the interesting physics for how the supermassive black hole binary forms and dynamically evolves to smaller separations. Um, some of the major hardening mechanisms should be stellar loss cone scattering, circumbinary disks, and differential accretion. And I expect that these are topics that we will hear and discuss uh, uh, quite a bit about uh, for the rest of the day today. So I will leave, leave it there and, uh, and take any questions that people might have. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for a fantastic summary. Um, uh, questions? Yeah, Caitlin. Hi, this is Caitlin here. I'll take the prerogative since I'm holding the mic already. Um, it was a really nice talk, really great overview, especially for those of us not working in the field. One thing I didn't get a sense about is uh, sort of how broad are the statistics for the dual AGN, which are in some ways the most direct measure. I know. Listening to the first part of your talk, it really reminds me of, you know, like the exoplanets in the 90s. You have a lot of indirect detection mecha me mechanisms and half the field is convinced that, oh, of course, these are all binaries and the other half is like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But the dual AGNs seem like, oh, okay, well, you see them both. So, you know, how many of them are there? What do we know? The mass ratio distribution, things like that. Yeah, a lot of progress on the dual AGN part has happened in the last 10 years. We went from knowing of like NGC 6240 to now having dozens of dual AGN. And the, the paper that I quoted, the Andy Goulding paper, did a calculation of gravitational wave background using one dual AGN. They took one and then did all the inferences from there to get the gravitational wave background. So I think it would be a really nice thing to do to take a population of more than one and put it together to do that kind of calculation again. And so um, the survey that I showed that my student Aaron Stemmo did, now postdoc at Vanderbilt, he's working on looking at the Chandra data to figure out whether there are two AGN present in these, because right now we're like, there's an AGN somewhere in this merger, but we can't see if it's there or there, or if there are two. And so we need to pin that down, and then we can use that sample to get uh, an inference of the gravitational wave background for more than one object, which is all that's been done so far. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there are a bunch of questions in the back. Why don't we go Julian, then Kiara, Savik, and Chi. Is your microphone on? Hi, and I must say first that I was. This is Julian Krolik, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that was um, very struck by your suggestion of melding kinematics with imaging to. Uh, find galaxy mergers. That sounds like a very promising approach. Um, but I was wondering why um, basically you appeared to show such confidence in searches for binaries via periodic shifts in the broad emission line profiles. 
Uh, the problem, of course, is that as soon as the velocity shift is large enough to be seen within the broad emission line profile, that's exactly the point at which the broad emission line material is no longer primarily seeing the gravity of its prime galaxy, the prime black hole, but the gravity of the system as a whole, which means the dynamics are now distorted and you don't expect that it's really riding with that original black hole. Yeah, I have a, I have a healthy skepticism of that approach as I think everyone who works in the field does, but there are lots of other uh, AGN physics that can mimic that kind of broad line velocity offset signature. So that's why just finding one Sloan spectrum with a velocity shifted uh, broad line doesn't tell you anything other than maybe this could be a binary. And so I think the spectroscopic monitoring campaigns that Jesse Renault and, and others have been doing to look, so you can start to look for, is there is there a periodic signal, signature like you would expect for binaries? Or is it something that we can attribute to some other effect? I think that's really important. So those are those are candidates. The only thing in that first part of the talk I would call a binary black hole would be uh, the Rodriguez source, the seven parsec separation source. Everything else is a candidate and needs more follow-up. Yeah, that's definitely the mm -hmm. best case. And the, but the point I wanted to emphasize is that the um, modulation, the broad line, is something that essentially you'd expect to kill itself. <laughs> and as soon as it becomes interesting, you shouldn't see it any longer. So actually, I wonder, I wonder, Tamara, if you have a comment on this, because I think this depends on the separation of the binary and the mass of the binary. Not appreciably. Uh, and I know Tamara worked a lot on this. Uh, so, hi, this is, this is Tamara, can you hear me? Yes. Right, so uh, what I will say is uh, that if the broad line region is Doppler shifted, one may expect to see a bulk shift in the broad emission line profile. Uh, but how exactly is that extracted and measured requires a lot of uh, observational know-how because the lines are very broad compared to the Doppler shifts that one would in principle expect given the orbital velocities of supermassive black hole binaries that actually are still wide enough to host their optical broadline regions because we are talking about broad optical emission line profiles that have been used from observations. So that that is my comment. The measurement is challenging, but the assumption is that the entire profile is offset by some small amount that is smaller than the width of the emission line profile itself. Hey, thank you. I hope that, that clarifies things a little. Uh, Chiara? So this is Chiara Mingarelli. First of all, what a wonderful talk. Uh, Julie, I love listening to your talks. It was such a really nice overview. Um, I wanted to just follow up with J1010. So the, uh, the two uh, AGN that we saw in Goulding et al. And I feel like I just want to clarify one point. So it's true that we did estimate the amplitude of the gravitational wave background from just the one source but that was our most pessimistic case, that there was only one. Uh, we then looked around J1010 and found 112 other candidates and then also estimated an optimistic amplitude of the background from that. So um, I totally agree that we need to find more of these sources, but I just wanted to clarify that point, that it's not just that we think that there's only one um, potential dual that signposts uh, candidates for gravitational wave background creating mergers. Yeah, thanks for expanding on that. You were very conservative in your assumptions in that paper, which which I appreciated. Okay, uh, actually, can we, uh, let's go yeah. to Savik. Hi, uh, so Savik Ford, um, and I, uh, echoing that, I think this is a, a great talk, and I just want to add a cautionary note though um, about photometric, uh, apparently periodic photometric light curve uh, signatures. 
um, that, I, that I think you know about, but uh, for folks who may not be uh, paying as much attention, when we have LSST data, one of the problems is, for example, the Graham 111 candidates that you noted, right? Um, if you continue watching them, about half of them have already evaporated because over short enough baselines, you can essentially overfit red noise and have quote unquote period, you know, they look periodic and they, they look good by eye. But then if you assume that that periodic signal continues and you keep watching them, then they start to deviate and you know, oh, okay, that's not really a binary. And so I think, you know, there's, I have concerns about understanding sort of what are the fundamental underlying AGN variability characteristics so that maybe we can do a little bit better job of uh, figuring out what some of these false positives are because when we start out with LSST, we're just, you know, by its very nature, we're gonna have short time baselines initially and we'll probably generate tons of candidates, most of which will in fact be bogus. <laughs> um, and so uh, just that note that LSST is a good thing, but we may also end up a little bit drowning if we're not careful. So actually, I want to I want to make a quick response to that as host prerogative. I think the special thing about LSST is that it goes uh, very deep and it's very large uh, because there are so many quasars. It can catch the very rare ones, which have very short periods, which are much rarer. So the candidates you're criticizing uh, fairly have year-long periods, so we only have three cycles. But if you look for candidates which have two-week periods, which are very rare, so they won't be in these surveys, they will show up in LSST, uh, and you can only find them if you go faint, because you need many more quasars. So then you can end up even in the first two years of LSST, where you have a periodic quasar with 50 periods, or something like that, and then that's, that's gonna be much more convincing. So that was the. So actually, we have one more question from the audience, which I like from a, I especially like from a student, and one from Zoom. So why don't we, why don't we actually, why don't you go ahead first and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Huan Ching. I work in primary on a quiz approximate zones. So I just have a question about the, the spiky. Um, I'm wondering, like, what is the probability that we can see the quasar and also have this kind of micro lensing. So it, is, is the fraction help us constrain the quasar opening angle and other things and this alignment? Many of the authors of the spiky paper are there in the room. So I think I'll turn it over to them. I think, I think many equals two. Dan, you wanna go ahead? Uh, so, right, you're asking about, so in the Durazio de Stefano 2018 paper, we calculated the probability that you have, if you have random inclination angles of your binary to the line of sight, what the probability is that it will be aligned close enough to edge on that you'll see this strong kind of flaring event. And that, of course, depends on the binary parameters, but for these kind of subparsec separation, supermassive black hole binaries, that can be a few to 10% for a, a given quasar. And then it's another question of um, how often do you have supermassive black hole binaries in that separation uh, regime. And so that's something we don't quite know yet, but we would learn from detecting candidates. Uh, so. Thank you. Uh, so let's take uh, one question from Zoom. Chin, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Hi, Julie. Thank hi, you. Sir. Thank you for a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so I, I just had a quick comment of, of following up to Julian's question and also Tamara's comment. Uh, so I, I think uh, there, there is definitely a big sum, assumption uh, in terms of the sweet spot between uh, you know, when you have a broad line region just around the secondary black hole, 
uh, and the acceleration is also big enough so that it can be uh, observed using radio velocity surveys. It's a big, definitely a big assumption going into the model. But the uh, uh, good news of that is that Jason, uh, Jason Dexter, I believe, ha has a paper uh, showing that with Gravity Plus, you'll be able to uh, actually uh, confirm the closest of these radio velocity candidates um, by looking at the photo center shift um, between the broad line region and the dust uh, thermal emission uh, you know, by monitoring the astrometry for a few years. So um, I agree that it is definitely um, uncertain, but the good news is that there is hope. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a, another quick comment from Daryl. This was just a plug for our discussion session this afternoon. So I hope you all are very excited about all of these topics and you'll join Chung Chung Shin and I for more conversations about these observations. Julie, I know you're two hours later and tomorrow I think you're at least two or three hours later than we are here. It's at 4 p.m. if you feel like spending your dinner with us. Uh, we'd <laughs> love to discuss more with you. So thanks. All right. Um, there's one last hand I see on Zoom. Is it very quick? Because uh, we're kind of moving to the next talk, but if it's very quick, then, uh, uh, Musumi, do you want to? Yeah, um, thank you, Julie, for the talk. Uh, this is Musumi. So I just wanted to ask you, are there any uh, VNPI surveys, you know, uh, for monitoring close AGN sources? So um, using, say, the a similar kind of network that you uh, uh, that detected M87 on VNPI scales, so that would be like parsec scales. Are there any monitoring experiments planned in radio? Uh, do you mean the radio monitoring experiment? Okay. Using VLBI. Using VLBI. Okay, so for this, I'm very interested in NGVLA and I've been keeping track of the planned baselines and I want them to be as long as possible because then the VLBI that you could do with the result in NGVLA would let you get to those really small separations. And if they're small enough separations, then maybe you could do a time campaign monitoring, you know, actually see, actually see some binaries move across the sky in real time, which would, which would be amazing. So yes, I would be very excited about the prospects with NGVLA. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm very bad at saying no. I see one last hand. If it's really quick, then this is really, really the last one. Roger Bunza, just just a rejoinder to uh, the comment made about looking for periodicity in the presence of red noise and wanting it to be predictive uh, to be sure that you're seeing a real period. Um, <clears throat> there's a corollary is that as happened in in Parks um, 2131-021, uh, which was a radio periodicity that we seen we just. Uh, 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 you can also be retrodictive, so you can get the period confirmed by looking backwards in time as well as forwards. And I think that's something, you know, and if you don't see it, then your confidence goes way down. And that happened in that case. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks again, Julia. It was fantastic. Uh,